Chapter 3 Worse James stumbled into the hallway, one hand clasped over his stomach. He glanced at the display on his mum's mobile. 48 missed calls, 4 texts. He turned the phone off and stuck his head in the living room. The light was off, TV on. His mum was asleep in her chair, and there was no sign of Ron. He's gone, James said. Thank God for that, Lauren said. He always kisses me, and his breath's revolting. Lauren pushed the front door shut and picked a handwritten note off the doormat. It's from your school. Lauren read aloud, struggling with the messy handwriting. Dear Mrs Choke, please contact either the school secretary or myself urgently on one of the numbers below. Can, can something concerning? James guessed. Concerning James's behaviour at school today, Lauren continued. Michael Rook, deputy head teacher. Lauren followed James into the kitchen. James ran a glass of tap water and slumped at the table. Lauren sat opposite and kicked off her trainers. Mum will absolutely massacre you, Lauren grinned. She was looking forward to seeing James suffer. Can't you shut up? I'm trying not to think about it. James locked himself in the bathroom. He was shocked by what the mirror showed him. The left side of his face and the ends of his cropped blonde hair were blood red. He emptied his pockets and stuffed his wrecked clothes in a bin liner. He'd hide them under the other rubbish later, so his mum didn't find them. Ending up in this mess made James start asking questions about himself. He knew he wasn't a very good person. He was always getting in fights. He was clever, but he never did any work, so he got bad marks. James remembered all the times his teachers had told him he was wasting his potential and that he'd end up in a bad way. He'd sat through billions of lectures with his brain turned off. Now he was beginning to think they were mostly right, and that made him hate them even more. James unscrewed the cap on a tube of antiseptic, but realised it was pointless without washing off the blood first. The hot shower soothed his face and stomach as a red puddle whirled around his feet. James wasn't sure if God existed, but he couldn't see how everything just got here without something making it. If there was ever a time to pray, this was it. He wondered if you were supposed to pray while naked in the shower, but figured, what the hell, and pressed his wet hands together. Hello, God. I'm not always good. Not ever, really. Just help me be good and stuff. Help me be a better person. Cheers. Amen. And please don't let Greg Jennings kill me. James looked awkwardly at his hands, not convinced about the power of prayer. After the shower, James put on his favourite clothes, an Arsenal shirt and a pair of tatty Nike tracksuit bottoms. He'd had to hide them from his mum. She chucked out anything that didn't look as if it had been shoplifted the previous week. She never understood that it was cooler if some of your clothes were a bit on the shabby side. After milk, two of Lauren's toasted sandwiches and half an hour playing GT4 with his duvet over him, James felt a bit better. Except his stomach killed if he moved suddenly, and he wasn't looking forward to telling his mum what he'd done when she woke up. Not that she looked like waking up soon. She must have had loads to drink. James crashed his car into the barrier and six cars whizzed past, leaving him in last place. He hurled the joypad. He always got that corner wrong. The computer-controlled cars went around like they were on rails, which made it seem like the game was rubbing it in. It was boring playing alone. But there was no point asking Lauren. She hated computer games. She only ever wanted to play football, or draw. James grabbed his mobile and called his friend Sam. Sam lived down the balcony and was in James's class. Hello, Mr Smith. It's James Choke. Is Sam there? Sam picked up the phone in his bedroom, sounding excited. Hey there, psycho, Sam said, laughing, 
<laughs> you are in so much trouble. That wasn't how James wanted the conversation to start. What happened after I left? Man, it was the sickest thing ever. Samantha had blood gushing out of her face, down her arms, everywhere. They took her in an ambulance. Miss Vult hurt her back, and she was crying and going, This is the last straw. I'm taking early retirement. Both the deputy heads and the headmaster came in. The headmaster saw Miles laughing and gave him a three-day suspension. James couldn't believe it. Three-day suspension for laughing? Oh, he was livid. You're totally expelled, James. No way. Yes way, psycho. You never even made it to your first half term. That's got to be the record for getting expelled. Did your mum give you beats? She doesn't know yet. She's asleep. Sam burst out laughing again. <laughs> asleep? Don't you think she might want you to wake her up to tell her you've been expelled? No, she won't care. James lied, trying to sound cool. So you want to come over and play PlayStation? Sam's voice got more serious. Nah, man. I've got homework. James laughed. <laughs> you never do homework. I started. The folks are pressuring me. Birthday presents hang in the balance. James knew Sam was lying, but couldn't figure out why. Normally, Sam asked his mum if he could come, and she always said yes. What? What have I done to upset you? It's not that, James, but... But what, Sam? Isn't it obvious? No. You're a mate, James, but we can't hang out until this dies down. Why the hell not? Because Greg Jennings is going to totally mash you, and if I'm seen with you, I'll be dead as well. You could help me stand up to him, James said. Sam thought this was the funniest thing yet. <laughs> My skinny ass is not going to make any difference against those guys. I really like you, James. You're a good friend, but at the moment, being your friend is a suicide mission. Thanks for your help, Sam. Well, should have switched your brain on before you decided to stab the hardest kid in school's little sister on a rusty nail. I never meant to hurt her. It was an accident. Ring me back when you get Greg Jennings to believe that. I can't believe you're doing this to me, Sam. you do the same if it was me, and you know it. So that's it. I'm a leper. It's a toughie, James. Sorry. Yeah. We can talk on the phone. I still like you. Thanks, Sam. I better go. Bye, James. I'm really sorry. Enjoy your homework. James ended the call and wondered about praying again. James watched rubbish TV until he fell asleep. He had a dream where Greg Jennings stood on his guts and woke with a jolt. He needed to pee bad. The pain in his guts was 50 times worse than earlier. The first drop of piss hitting the toilet was red. James did a double take. Bright red. He was peeing blood. After he'd been to the toilet, the pain was mostly gone, but he was scared. He had to tell his mum. The TV in the living room was still turned up loud. James flicked it off. Mum, James said. James felt weird. His mum was too quiet. He touched her hand. Cold. He put his hand in front of her face. She wasn't breathing. No pulse. Nothing. James hugged Lauren in the back of the ambulance. Their mum's corpse was two feet away, with a blanket on top. Lauren's hands clawed into James's back. James was freaking, but he tried to keep a lid on himself to stop Lauren getting worse. When the ambulance arrived at casualty, James watched his mum get wheeled off on a trolley. He realised this was going to be his final memory of her. A bulging blanket lit by flashing blue bulbs. James had to step off the ambulance with Lauren holding on. There was no way she was letting go. She'd stopped crying and was panting like an animal. Lauren walked like a zombie. The driver led them through the waiting room to a cubicle. A doctor was waiting. She knew what had happened. I'm Dr. May. You must be Lauren and James. 
James rubbed Lauren's shoulder to try and calm her down. Lauren, can you let go of your brother so we can talk? Lauren acted deaf. It's like she's dead, James said. She's in shock. I'll have to give her something to calm down or she'll pass out. Dr. May picked a syringe off a trolley and pulled up the sleeve of Lauren's t-shirt. Hold her still. As soon as the needle went in, Lauren went limp. James leaned her down on the bed. Dr. May picked up Lauren's legs and covered her with a blanket. Thank you, James said. You told that ambulance driver that you had some blood in your urine, Dr. May said. Yeah. Did something hit you in the stomach? Someone, James said. I got in a fight. Is it bad? When you were hit, your insides started to bleed. It's the same as a cut on the outside. It should heal itself. Come back here if it hasn't stopped by tomorrow night. So what happens to us now? James asked. There's a social worker coming to see you. She'll contact your relatives. I don't have relatives. My nan died last year and I don't know who my dad is. Chapter 4 Care James woke up the next morning in a strange bed with sheets that smelled of disinfectant. He had no idea where he was. The last thing he remembered was a nurse giving him a sleeping pill and walking towards a car with his head weighing a million tons. He had his clothes on, but his trainers were on the floor. He took his head out of the covers and saw another bed with Lauren poking out of it. She was sleeping with her thumb in her mouth. James hadn't seen her do that since she was little. Whatever dreams Lauren was having, the thumb wasn't a good sign. He got out of bed. The pill had made him dull. His jaw felt stiff and there was a weird ache in his forehead. The room was bright, even though the curtains were drawn. James slid a door and found the shower and toilet. He was relieved to see that his pee came out the normal colour. James splashed water on his face. He knew he ought to be upset about his mum dying, but he felt dead inside. Everything felt so unreal. It was like sitting in an armchair, watching himself on television. James peeked out of the window. Tons of kids were running around. He remembered that one of his mum's favourite threats was to stick him in a home if he didn't behave. A buzzer sounded when James went out of the room. A care worker came out of an office and offered him her hand. James shook it, a bit stunned by her purple hair and the metalwork hanging off each ear. Hello, James. I'm Rachel. Welcome to Nebraska House. How are you? James shrugged. I'm really sorry about what happened to your mum. Thank you, miss. Rachel laughed. <laughs> We're not at school here, James. They call me all sorts of rude things, but never miss. Sorry. I'll give you the tour. Then you can have some breakfast. You hungry? A bit, James said. Listen, James, Rachel said as she walked. This place is a dump, and I know your life seems horrible now, but there are lots of good people here to help you. Right, James said. Our luxury spa, said Rachel. She pointed out the window at a paddling pool filled with rainwater and cigarette ends. James smiled a bit. Rachel seemed nice, even though she probably used the same lines on every freak that ended up here. State-of-the-art sports complex, strictly out of bounds until homework is finished. They walked through a room with a dartboard and two pool tables. The green felt was stuck down with carpet tape and there was an umbrella stand filled with tipless and split cues. All the rooms are upstairs, boys first floor, girls second. The baths and showers are down here, Rachel continued. We usually have trouble getting you lads into them. My room has a shower in it, James said. That room's the reception for new arrivals. You only get one night in there. They reached the dining room. There were a couple of dozen kids, mostly in school uniform. Rachel pointed everything out. Cutlery there, hot food at the bar, cereal and fruit juice. Make your own toast if you want it. Cool, James said. He didn't feel cool. The room full of strange, noisy kids was intimidating. 
When you've eaten, see me in my office. What about my sister? James asked. If she wakes up, I'll bring her to you. James got some frosties and sat on his own. The other kids ignored him. New arrivals were obviously nothing unusual. Rachel was on the phone. Her desk was stacked with papers and folders. A cigarette burned in an ashtray. Rachel put the phone down and took a puff. She saw James glance at the no smoking sign. If they sack me, they'll be six staff short, she said. Do you want a cigarette? James was shocked to be offered a cigarette by an adult. I don't smoke. Good, Rachel said. They give you cancer. But we'd rather give them to you than have you stealing them from shops. Shift my junk. Make yourself comfortable. James moved a pile from the chair with the least stuff on it and sat down. How do you feel, James? I think the sleeping pill they gave me is making me groggy. That'll wear off. I really mean, how do you feel about what happened to your mum? James shrugged. Bad, I guess. The important thing is not to keep it to yourself. We'll schedule some time with a counsellor, but you can chat to any of us house parents in the meantime, even if it's three in the morning. Does anyone know why she died? James asked. As far as I understand, your mum was taking painkillers for an ulcer on her leg. She wasn't supposed to drink, James said. Something to do with that, isn't it? The painkillers and the alcohol mixed up put your mum into a deep sleep. Her heart stopped beating. If it's any comfort, your mother wouldn't have suffered. What happens to us? James asked. I don't believe you have any relatives. Only my stepdad. I call him Uncle Ron. The police found him last night. They probably had him in a cell, James said. Rachel smiled. I sensed that the two of you don't get on when I spoke to him last night. You spoke to Ron? Yes. Do you get on well with Lauren? Mostly, James said. We row ten times a day, but we always have a laugh. Ron was still married to your mum when she died, even though they lived apart. Ron is Lauren's father, so he gets automatic custody of her if he wants it. We can't live with Ron. He's a bum. James, Ron has very strong feelings that Lauren shouldn't be taken into care. He's her father. There's nothing we can do to stop him unless there's a history of abuse. The thing is, James. James fitted the pieces together for himself. He doesn't want me, does he? I'm sorry. James looked down at the floor, trying not to get upset. Being in care was bad, but Lauren getting stuck with Ron was worse. Rachel walked around her desk. She put her arm around him. I'm so sorry, James. James wondered why Ron even wanted Lauren. How long can we stay together? Ron said he'd come in later this morning. Can't we stay together for a few days? This might seem hard to understand now, James, but delaying the separation will make things worse. You'll still be able to visit each other. He won't look after her properly. Mum does all the washing and stuff. Lauren's scared of the dark. She can't go to school on her own. Ron won't help her. He's useless. Try not to worry, James. We'll make regular visits to see that Lauren settles into her new home. If she's not properly looked after, something will be done. So what happens to me? Am I stuck here? Until we find you a foster home. That means you go and live with a family that takes in children like you for a few months at a time. There's also a chance that you'll be adopted, which means another couple will look after you permanently, exactly as if they were your real parents. How long does all that take? James asked. We're short of foster families at the moment, a few months at least. Perhaps you should spend time with your sister before Ron comes. James went back to the bedroom. He gently nudged Lauren awake. She came around slowly, sitting up and picking sleep out of the corners of her eyes. What's this? Lauren asked. Hospital? Children's home. My head aches, Lauren said slowly. I feel all queasy. You remember last night? I remember you telling me mum died and waiting for the ambulance to come. 
I must have fallen asleep. I had to give you an injection to calm you down. The nurse said you'd feel weird when you woke up. Are we staying here? Ron's coming to pick you up later. Just me? Yeah. I think I'm going to spew, Lauren said. She covered her mouth. James sprang back, not wanting to get sprayed. There's a toilet in there, he said, pointing. Lauren dashed into the bathroom. James heard her throwing up. She coughed for a bit, then flushed the toilet. It went quiet for a minute. James knocked. You okay? Can I come in? Lauren didn't answer. James stuck his head around the door. Lauren was crying. What's my life going to be like living with Dad? She sobbed. James wrapped his arms around his sister. Her breath smelled like puke, but James didn't care. Lauren had always just been there. James had never realised how much he'd miss her if she was gone. Lauren calmed down a bit and had a shower. She couldn't face breakfast, so they sat in the games room. All the other kids had gone to school. The time until Uncle Ron arrived was painful. James wanted to say something amazing to cheer her up and make things right. Lauren looked down at the floor, banging her Reeboks on the chair leg. Ron arrived with an ice cream. Lauren said she didn't want it, but took it anyway. She wasn't in any state to argue. James tried not to cry in front of Ron. Lauren was so choked up she couldn't talk. If you want to see Lauren, here's the number, Ron said. He handed James a scrap of paper. I'm having the flat cleared, Ron said. I spoke to the social worker outside. They're taking you round later. Any of your crap still there on Friday goes in the rubbish. James couldn't believe Ron was acting nasty on a day like this. You killed her, James said. You brought all that drink to the flat. I didn't force it down her throat, Ron said. And don't get your hopes up about seeing Lauren very often. James felt like he was about to explode. <laughs> when I'm big enough, I'll kill you, he said. I swear to God. Ron laughed. <laughs> I'm quaking in my boots. Hopefully some of the bigger lads here will knock some manners into you. It's about time somebody did. Ron grabbed Lauren's hand and took her away. Chapter 5. Safe. James raked up the pool balls and blasted the white into them. It didn't matter where the balls went. He only wanted a distraction from the awful stuff going around his head. He'd been playing for hours when a jug-eared 20-something introduced himself. Kevin McHugh, dog's body, former inmate, he laughed. I mean, resident, of course. Hey, James said, not in the mood for jokes. Let's get your stuff. They walked outside to a minibus. I heard about your mum, James. That's tough. Kevin craned his neck, looking for a gap to pull out into the traffic. Thanks, Kevin. You lived here once? For three years. Dad went down for armed robbery. Mum had a breakdown. I got on all right with all the staff here, so they gave me this job when I turned 17. Is it okay? James asked. It's not a bad place. Look after your stuff, though. Everything gets nicked. First chance you get, buy a decent padlock and stick it on your locker. Sleep with a key tied around your neck. Don't even take it off in the bath. If you've got cash, we'll get you a lock on the way home. Is it rough? James asked. You'll be okay. You look like you can stand up for yourself. There's a few hard cases, same as anywhere. Just don't wind them up, is all. The flat was a tip. A lot of valuable stuff had disappeared. The TV, video and hi-fi were gone from the living room. The telephone was gone in the hall and the microwave from the kitchen. What happened? Kevin asked. Was it like this last night? I half expected this, James said. Ron's been here and stripped the place. I hope he's left my stuff alone. James ran upstairs to his room. His TV, video and computer were gone. I'll stab him, he screamed. James kicked his wardrobe door. At least Ron had left the PlayStation 2 and most other stuff. Kevin came in. 
You're not going to be able to take all this, Kevin said, looking at the piles of stuff. Your mum must have been loaded. We'd better take as much as we can. Ron says the house is being cleared Friday. James had a thought. He asked Kevin to start packing his clothes in bin liners and went to his mum's room. Ron had taken the portable TV and the jewellery box from the dressing table, but that was no biggie because Ron had stolen all the good jewellery years ago. James opened his mum's wardrobe and looked at her safe. There were thousands inside. Gwen Choke was a criminal. She couldn't keep money in the bank without people wanting to know where it came from. Judging by the tools on the carpet and the scratches around the safe door, Ron had made a fairly pathetic attempt to get in. He'd be back with better equipment. James knew he'd never break open the safe. When it was delivered, it took three guys to carry it up the stairs. There was no key. You dialed a combination of numbers with the big knob on the front. The only clue James had was that one time he'd walked in and surprised his mum while she was unlocking it. She'd been holding a Danielle Steele novel, and it made sense that she would hide the combination inside the kind of book he and Ron wouldn't touch with a ten-foot pole. But what if she changed the combination since then? It was James's only chance to beat Ron to the money, so he was at least going to try. Gwen had a handful of novels on a shelf over her bed. James found the Danielle Steele and flicked through the pages. Are you all right in there, James? Kevin shouted from the other bedroom. James was so tense he flew about a metre up in the air and dropped the book. Fine, James shouted. He picked the open book off the floor. There was a set of numbers written in the margin on the page in front of him. The book must have been opened to the same page hundreds of times. It sprung to the right place as soon as he let go. James felt luck was on his side for the first time in days. He scooted across the carpet and dialed in the numbers. 262, 118, 320, 145, 077. He grabbed the handle. Nothing happened. It wasn't going to work. The thought of Uncle Ron getting his hands on the money made James gag. Then he noticed a sticker under the dial with instructions on how to use the safe. He read the first instruction. 1. Dial the first number of the combination by turning the dial in an anti-clockwise direction. James hadn't realised that the direction you turned the dial made any difference. He dialed in the first number and carried on reading. 2. Dial the subsequent four numbers by turning the dial as follows. Clockwise, anti-clockwise, anti-clockwise and clockwise. Failure to observe this procedure will result in non-operation of the mechanism. He dialed the first four numbers. What are you playing at? Kevin asked. James spun around. Kevin was standing in the doorway. Luckily, the open wardrobe door stopped him seeing the safe. Kevin seemed nice, but James was sure that any adult who found out about the safe would make him give the contents either to the police or to Uncle Ron. Looking for stuff, James said, convinced he sounded suspicious. Come and help me pack, James. I don't know what you want. I'll be out in a minute, James said. I'm just looking for photo albums. Oh, do you want me to help you look for them? No, James said, practically squealing. We've got 15 minutes, Kevin said. I've got to do a school run in an hour. Kevin finally went back to the other room. James dialed in the fifth number. The safe made a satisfying click. He read the third instruction before he pulled on the handle and couldn't help smiling. 3. For security purposes, this sticker should be removed once you are familiar with the unit. James swung the heavy door open. The inside of the safe was surprisingly small because the metal lining was so thick. There were four tall piles of cash inside and a tiny envelope. James took a bin liner and shoved the money in. He tucked the envelope into his pocket. James imagined Ron's face when he walked in and saw the safe open. Then he thought of something even better. He peeled the instruction sticker from the safe door and put it and the Danielle Steele novel inside. As a final touch, to make Ron extra mad, James took a framed picture of himself from his mum's bedside cabinet 
and stood it inside the safe so it would be the first thing Ron saw when he eventually broke it open. James shut the door, gave the dial a spin, and replaced the tools exactly how Ron had left them. James was in a slightly better mood when he walked back to his bedroom, holding the cash. The room looked bare. Kevin had bagged up all the clothes and bedding that was usually strewn over the floor. I found the photo albums, James said. Good, but I'm afraid you're going to have to make some sacrifices, James. All you've got in Nebraska house is one wardrobe, a chest of drawers, and a locker. James started hunting through the toys and junk on the floor. He was surprised how little he cared about most of his stuff. He wanted his PlayStation 2, mobile phone, and portable CD player, but that was about it. Everything else was toys and stuff that he'd grown out of. The annoying thing was, Ron had taken his TV, so he had nothing to use the PlayStation on. Kevin crouched down looking at a Sega Dreamcast and a Nintendo GameCube. Don't you want these? Kevin asked. I only use the PlayStation 2, James said. Take them if you want. I can't take gifts from residents. James kicked the consoles into the middle of the floor. I don't want my stepdad to get the money from selling them. I'm not taking them with me. If you don't take them, I'll trash them. Kevin didn't know what to say. James slammed the heel of his trainer into the Sega. Surprisingly, little happened. So he picked it up and threw it at the wall. The case smashed. It slid down the wall and dropped behind the bed. Kevin quickly bent down and rescued the GameCube. Okay, James, I'll tell you what. I'll take your GameCube and the games, and in return, I'll buy your padlock for you on the drive back. Is that a deal? Fair enough, James said. When they packed up the last few things and carried the bin liners out to the minibus, James had a quick last look into every room of the flat that he'd lived in since he was born. By the time he reached the front door, he had tears on his face. Kevin tapped the horn of the minibus. He'd already started the engine. James ignored him and went back one last time. He couldn't leave the flat without a memento of his mum. He rushed upstairs to her room and looked around. James remembered that when he was a toddler, he used to sit at his mum's dressing table after they'd shared a bath. She'd pull a pyjama top over his head, then stand over him and brush his hair. It was before Lauren was born. Just the two of them, feeling tired and smelling of shampoo. James felt warm and sad. He found the battered wooden hairbrush and tucked it into the waistband of his tracksuit bottoms. Once he had the brush, it felt easier to leave.